welcome to today's bonus huddle. I'm really excited to have the honor of interviewing Karen Starnes, the CEO of Ojo Canada, who has accomplished the relatively unusual feat of transitioning from CMO to CEO. Karen's journey, I think, serves as a beacon of inspiration for B2B CMOs who aspire to take on the top leadership role. In the next 45 minutes or so, we'll explore some of the building blocks, both planned and perhaps serendipitous, that helped Karen get to the CEO role, as well as some of the lessons that she learned along the way. So hello, Karen. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Drew. I am here in Austin, Texas, hunkered down at home. It's supposed to be 106 today. So many of us who were going to go into the office thought maybe this would be a work from home day. Yeah, it is certainly, you know, hot, hot, hot out there across the country. All right. Well, welcome. And, you know, looking at your LinkedIn profile, you've spent the bulk of your career in marketing, starting with 13 years at Microsoft, a yeah. couple of stints at Amazon, sandwiched between three years at Pearson. And then you were the CMO of Ojo for more than three and a half years. As you look back at these experiences, what were a couple of choices that you made that helped prepare you for an executive leadership role? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I would say, you know, it, you can go back and find the breadcrumbs, which perhaps at the, at the time weren't really intentional, but I'm a learner. And so throughout my career, I've made it a practice to seek out messy, challenging work where success isn't guaranteed, often projects other people didn't want to do, things that might involve change management, acquisition, structuring, restructuring, turnarounds. And I found that you learn way more from that less attractive stuff. And well, I raised my hand to lead consumer marketing for Bing during one of its turnarounds. I was really very excited to take on offline retail experience at Amazon, despite a host of challenges in that most of our devices were sold online. So trying to figure out the role of offline retail. But I really feel like taking that hard road, whether you succeed or you fail, really is incredibly valuable in the long term, and especially for the role of CEO. So, you know, I feel like I've kind of put put the miles in. Yeah, and it's so interesting. I think I'm I'm remembering a couple of books that I read from CEOs. And there's often that thing, they, they took the hard challenges, they took the ones that others didn't want to. So I, I definitely can see that as not just something that worked for you, but it is an approach that I've read about as, as something that folks can do, because often everybody else doesn't want to do it. And <laughs> right, they just go, no, 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 okay, you, you yeah, take it. You. So exactly. there's another part of this, which is, we talk a lot, a lot about this in CMO huddles about what's your plus as in CMO plus and thinking about going beyond the job of CMO. And we talked, you and I talked a little bit about that in your plus while you were the CMO of, of Ojo. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, happy to. So at Ojo, my plus came on the culture side in a couple of concrete ways. And I use the word concrete intentionally. Drew and I had an interesting back and forth on this topic. And so I'm going to double, I'm doubling down on kind of the value of doing this. I think it, it can be a miss or a misperception to think about culture or ways of working as kind of fluffy or optional. I, you know, having worked at a lot of companies known for their culture, I know that it can be such a big factor in the success of a business. And so my contributions on culture at Ojo, the first one was really about building new muscle around scaling. And so I took a lot of what I brought with me from Amazon, Drew mentioned, I had two stints there. Things like the development of repeatable mechanisms, strategic tools, like working backwards documents, that really kind of set us on a path to say, like, how can we scale? How can we be efficient? How can we be really predictable in the way that we're going to do some of our things? The other aspect was providing leadership around defining and operationalizing values and behaviors. And I think the operationalizing piece is so important to say, like, what does it look like? What do we expect from people? Are we using the language in our meetings? Are we you know, moving beyond 
its words on a wall somewhere or on a plaque. And, you know, these were key contributions that I made kind of in my CMO plus but ultimately, those are things that are in the CEO lane. So when I had the opportunity to do those in my new role, I had already spent quite a bit of time kind of honing it and, you know, having, having some things in my toolbox that I could pull out. Yeah. And, and just winding back a second on this, I asked a very sensitive question about would there be, oh, you're the woman who's doing culture. And that's why I, I brought yeah. it up because I have had conversations where there are certain things that ambitious women don't want to take on because they don't want to be labeled as X, Y, Z. I think it's a fair question. I look at it and say like, I don't mind doing any important work. And at the time it was a place where I could contribute at the highest right. level and have things to bring to the table that others didn't. Well, and just to emphasize, I mean, no company can be successful without employees. I mean, for, you know, you just can't be. So if you get the culture right and get the values right, you have a real competitive edge from the get-go. So I'm curious, was there a particular point in your career when you realized you wanted to be a CEO and what drew you to that? Yeah. So when I was a child, if someone asked me, you know, the, the question, what do you want to be when you grew up? My answer was in charge. Or sometimes it was orthodontist. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, what drives me most is contributing to a business at the highest level. And my appetite for the CEO role really has taken hold in the past five or so years. You know, I've been in the tech space more than 25 years. And part of that is really the scope and the importance of the CMO role growing and the opportunity for me to do so many things. I mean, you all know so well that like our roles as CMOs are so rich and so varied that you really can't compare them to other roles in the C-suite given how many different things that, that we often have kind of within our scope. And, and so part of that is like, increasing in scope really caused me to think about the CEO role as being, you know, an interesting and viable potential path. And so what I thought was really interesting is you actually had this conversation with your CEO when you were CMO. Talk a little bit about yeah. that conversation and how it went and how did it, how did it come up? How'd you even get there? Yeah, he's a funny and great guy. And I think it really started in, you know, we probably all did deep reflection in the pandemic. So a weekend in late 2021, I really wanted to just spend some time thinking about, you know, kind of what I wanted to do, not only with the rest of my career, but with the rest of my life. And so I did some work laying out kind of my top personal and professional goals and ambitions and Number four on the list after mom, CMO, board member of a public company was the idea, the joined up idea of entrepreneur or CEO. And I had this kind of parenthetical note there that said like solo or alt career path. And I sent it to my CEO and said, hey, I'd love to have a career discussion with you. You know, I really value your perspective. And when we sat down, that was the first thing he honed in on, right? It's like a, a really dense one pager and about a midway down, right? Like the parenthetical piece on item four, he was like, what's this? And we talked about it, you know, and at first, you know, it's kind of like, what the hell do you want my job? And I said, you know, maybe, but really we got into the heart of like, what would that look like? How could I use my time and my role as CMO to best prepare for those, you know, things like more board exposure, which I had plenty of because we'd done a bunch of brand work and that's, you know, super interesting for the board. Conversations about how we might broaden my scope and then really diving into, you know, areas where I was driving results for the business. And, and, and so we kind of left it at that. And then six plus seven, eight months later, when the likelihood of this acquisition that, that put me in the role that I have right now, as that likelihood was increasing, I reached out to him to make the case. And that turned out to be a really kind of positive initial kind of reaction from him. And then there was several months of a process where 
you know, I was running a, a bit of a skunk works, a presumed leadership team in case this acquisition happened, we were getting ready to say, you know, what would it look like on the other side? And, and, and so I'm really uh, thankful for that support. And you mentioned that you, you know, were on a public board and maybe you still are. How much credibility does that give you? Because I know that as a board member, you're really there as a business person, not a marketer, even though you got there perhaps because you bring marketing expertise to the table. How important at all, if, if at all, was having that experience to help you get the CEO nod? Yeah, I would say, you know, to a degree. Right now I'm on a nonprofit board. I'm not on a public board. Oh, okay. So I still have that aspiration. Got it. And had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with the Ojo Labs board as well. You know, I think it's it's always a full set of experiences and elements that help make the case. You know, I have set up, even though we are an RBC company, we're owned by a, you know, a giant financial institution, we're running our organization with a board. And so one of the early actions that I had with with the the team that has brought us into the company is to set up a board. And so now I've got the opportunity to lead and run the board. We've got our second board meeting coming up in about a month. Okay. So we talked about the need to have PL responsibility at some mm -hmm. point in your career. It's often one that, you know, CMOs that have e-commerce, for example, under them, they get that because they get to yeah. run literally a business where they mm -hmm. are not just driving demand, but they're, they're closing deals and driving revenue for the company. Where did you get your P&L experience and how important is this relative to the other skills that you've gained along the way? You know, I think this can be a tricky one. And, and let me kind of take a, a slight step back and say, like, in my view, any requirement in a job description is never as black and white as it seems. And so I wouldn't have anything, any criteria that I didn't meet be the reason that I didn't raise my hand. And, and so I think regarding PL, it certainly depends on the business. I've managed, you know, a billion plus dollar budgets as a CMO, right? That's the spend side. I've driven, you know, highly compelling ROI through advertising, especially when I was at Amazon. You know, I can speak to being a highly commercially minded leader and someone who's delivered growth. And to me, that alone feels like a strong case. And none of that is P&L. But that said, I did manage what I would call a mini P&L for our Amazon devices and services for those physical retail efforts that I mentioned. So offline retail sat with me. And it was an opportunity to kind of look at that little P&L and manage that entire kind of business as a, as a single threaded owner. So I would just say to, to this group, you know, if you don't have P&L experience and you want it, think about, you know, a smaller medium project where you can throw your hat in the ring and say, like, I want to manage this thing holistically, be the single threaded owner. Otherwise, I really wouldn't sweat it. I just look to your other bona fides that show that you're, you know commercially minded and financially savvy and, you know, and lean on your other strengths that um, are irrefutable. So I'm thinking about the CMO plus idea and there you are taking on culture. And I know, and you know, that there's so many demands on the CMO that it's hard to find time. And now we're saying, oh, why don't you just go ahead and take care of culture? Or why don't you run innovation or what? And, and I'm curious, you know, the, the answer to me at least is you really have to have strong people in place. Talk a little bit about your approach to your number twos and how those folks really allowed you to be that CMO plus that helped you get to CEO. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so I think that part of this is giving, giving trust, right? Giving people the opportunity that someone probably gave you to, to step up right? The opportunity to fail, the opportunity to show what they're able to do. So in some cases, right, you have that ready now successor where you can continue to give them more and more, which allows you to focus your attention on some of these other kind of plus things. In other cases, they're unproven, right? You have nurtured that talent and now it's the time for them to step up so you don't have to step down because you're going to go kind of build out your portfolio and it doesn't always work 
But I would say, you know, for the most part uh, throughout my career, as I've made bets on people and as I have pulled back maybe sooner than I might have thought that I should to give someone that chance to, to lean in, more often than not, you know, they show so much of what they have that you didn't even see. And so, you know, to me, it is about you're making a bet on people and, you know, and then you're there as a safety net because you are their leader, you are the functional head. Right. Interesting. Thinking about the CMO to CEO role. And also it's funny because the same thing happens when a CMO gets on a board. There is a cliche that when a CMO becomes a CEO, they're all in the underwear of the CMO. And similarly, when they're on a board, they might do that, which is sort of board mistake number one. No, you're mm -hmm. there as a business person, not as the marketing person. But I'm curious how your perspective and priorities changed when you transitioned? Mm -hmm. And then there's a second part of that that we can talk about with now, how are you interacting with the marketing, given your knowledge? Yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, my priorities today are about people, culture, results, and board management. And as a new entity, right, we're a brand new organization, we weren't a, a kind of an existing group that got spent out. So I am like, literally like founding a company inside of a company. I'm spending a lot of time on vision and planning as well, right? I see those as key inputs to results. And day to day, I'm not in the weeds on individual strategies, but I'm making sure that I've got the time to, to jump in, to deep dive, you know, kind of where and when the business needs me. And so talk about your relationship with your senior marketer and, and, and how you've sort of navigated that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I got, and it's a timely question because I got a piece of feedback yesterday of like what some, somebody was worried about. And, and it was essentially that they were worried that I wasn't going to be as hard on the CMO because of our history and my background and that, you know, that that hadn't panned out and that I was holding kind of an equal and high bar of accountability for, for everyone. It's not been as hard as you would imagine to stay out of the weeds of the job that I used to have. And at the same time, there's a couple of places like brand, which is kind of my first love where I said to, to my, I've given him the title that I always wanted. He's the chief growth officer that my CMO slash CGO has. And I said to him, like, you know how many times I've done this, you know, as he's kind of in the throes of some complex decision-making on brand. And he didn't need that reminder, but it was for me to say like, I'm right, I'm not gonna try to do your job for you, but please use me as a resource. And we've had a really great collaboration, you know, in that particular area that is, you know, pretty high stakes for the business. CGO, why did you want that title and why did you bestow that title and what makes that different from a CMO title? Well, I think that, you know, one of our biggest jobs as a CMO is to be a growth driver, right? When I think about like marketing with a capital M, it is that you are a growth driver. It's not the, you know, olden days of, you know, Marcom and things like that. And, you know, for me looking at someone, I mean, you all are in the B2B space, we're in the consumer space, right? Driving pipeline, driving acquisition, having ownership for that, managing the funnel and wanting to really shine the light that the role had the breadth of accountability, you know, including that. And, you know, when I think about that, I think about, well, products and innovation and new markets. So that means that this individual has product reporting to them? He has product marketing reporting to him. He doesn't have, he doesn't have product. He has acquisition and funnel accountability. Interesting. Interesting. And I, you know, and I don't, there's, there's no right answer here. It's just, how do you drive growth if you don't control product? You really have to collaborate pretty carefully with them. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. So are you seeing the CMO role differently than you did when you were when in that seat? But I would say that as now I have accountability, you know, kind of a, a whole C-suite reporting to me and kind of looking at the range of those roles, I think I might have a greater appreciation for 
how much scope we jam pack into, you know, some pretty, you know, small and mighty teams and that a lot is riding on our shoulders as, as CMOs. Oh, interesting. So you're more sympathetic for the role than- I than... think so. Oh, interesting. I think so. Oh, okay. Because it's not always the case. Sometimes it's that, oh, I've been there. I've done that. I know. And so get on it. Now, interestingly, I've spoken to a number of CMOs within the CMO Huddles community who have no interest in being a CEO. Part of it is their concern that having the whole business on their shoulders is just too darn stressful. And I'm curious, from your standpoint, are you finding it more or less the same different than when you were CMO? Yeah, to be quite honest, because that's why we're here, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm finding the controllable aspects of the CEO role less stressful than being CMO, right? I have access to all the information I need. I've done a great job with the people that I've brought on board. I have an excellent executive team leading the charge. And so I've got all the people who are, you know, driving the facets of the business that, that I need to drive. I would say the parts of the role that are toughest now are those that are associated with integration. And so, you know, anyone who's been through M&A is going to understand, right, that change management and that point in time, however many, you know, months that that is, you know, that can be pretty intense. So I wouldn't say it's, it's a cakewalk, but I actually don't feel it as kind of being another layer of stress. I'm sleeping pretty well. <laughs> That's amazing and and important in all this. It's it's funny and and I just thinking about the CEO role and in my mind one of the definitions that you have three jobs. One is build the team to you know set the vision, build the team, and then allocate resources, and then off they go. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. And, and if you get the team right, then, you know, a lot of other challenges go away, but another sort of challenge that CMOs talk about, you know, behind closed doors is our, my CEO called me at nine o'clock on a Saturday night to chat about something in a brand campaign that could have waited till Monday. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just wondering how you're approaching that in just, there's, Things you just think about all the time and you go, oh, Completely. gosh, yeah. Yeah, curiosity can get the best of you. And so, you know, I'm learning every day. I'm trying to be kind of, you know, smarter about asking the right questions, especially of my COO, but also asking him at the right time, right? So keeping a pulse on the business or, or you know, asking those additional questions in a way that isn't randomizing is really important because I want to be equipped in all of the interactions that I'm having. And at the same time, I don't want to be this like X factor, right? Swooping into people's Slack or, or, or texts. And so I think there's a, a takeaway here that even goes kind of broadly to your own direct team, but it's about realizing as the CEO that you have to add some caveats or some context to those inquiries, right? Am I curious? Do I need this now? Is this direction? Is it input? Am I just sharing a perspective or am I just musing about the, like, what if has anyone ever thought of? And so, you know, adding, you know, some, some language to make the request or the comment more specific is really important because otherwise people are going to take all of that as direction. Yeah. Right. And they're going to run off and like spend the weekend doing something when you're like, oh, I just, <laughs> I me just mentioned that. Right. I didn't think that someone was going to, you know, burn their night or their weekend getting that answered. And so, yeah, I mean, suddenly every email or, or, or text thread or Slack channel message is going to have much more importance than you might have. Uh, it's certainly going to have a sense of urgency. So tempering that makes a, makes sure. a lot of sense. I'm, I'm fascinated by what you had to do. So if you were, we're talking to the CMOs here and they're obviously interested in this is at least uh, in their career, what were some of the accomplishment benchmarks that you had at Ojo when you were the CMO that you could sort of point to and say, I'm doing a damn good job in marketing. And I'm just curious what those, what those metrics were and, or KPIs and how you sort of said, I'm ready because I've done this job. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I certainly wouldn't say my last job is the whole case right. um, for the current job, but to call out some things from, from Ojo, I would certainly say, you know, the work that I did on brand specifically as a CMO, we went through a rebrand, we went through a visual identity change and right, all the complexity that comes in that you're pulling it all the way through product, not just through, through go to market. One of the things that I did in this role that I'd never done in my career was having PR and communications as part of my role. And I loved doing that. And not only, you know, kind of just your, your typical product announcements and earned media side, but standing up a data storytelling practice. And so being able to get more value out of the consumer and market data that we were sitting on, you know, inside of our product experience and turning that into very interesting fodder for reporters that just blew any coverage that we had out of the water. As a startup, also awards strategy, right? So great places to work, great tech companies, winning AI awards, winning thought leadership awards. I mean, if you all have done that, you know, there's machinery and strategy and a lot of energy that goes in behind that. And as a company that's like in fundraising mode, all of those things are really incredibly important, you know, in addition to what you're doing to drive consumer engagement, things like, you know, uh, retention, usage of your product, right? We had kind of the, the whole life cycle there, but I would kind of point to the pieces that probably are most relevant to a company in a startup mode that really is about, right, how you're being perceived and how you're kind of showing up in a space as you're, as you're trying to ramp your business. A couple of things I want to sort of highlight in that, and and one is the the data storytelling, and just you had data that you could in house that you could use that would help generate PR. I, I'm sorry, I want to go back to brand. At what point in time? Because this was this is a bigger deal. Okay. At what point in your three and a half years as CMO did you start the rebranding process? Well, we started and then we restarted. So about a year and a half in is when we started with, you know, kind of real emphasis. And that was six months after we made a really big acquisition. So we acquired a real estate search portal that was bigger than the business we were running. And it's Mavoto, the brand was Mavoto on that, and we were Ojo Labs. And so, right, that introduced a complexity that said, okay, we've got, we've got some work to do to figure out what our brand architecture is looking, is going to look like, what we want that strategy to be. And so, you know, we really started from the very beginning. So and there... Right. There was a business need to do that. I, I just, and I'll tell you the reason I asked this question. I have seen any number of B2B CMOs start a rebranding process in their first six months, often to their detriment, because if you're doing that, you may or may not at the same time be building the demand engine and driving, doing the things that help really drive growth. And so it's, a, it can be a kiss of death. Which is it, yeah, it it can be. And if you're you're part of a leadership team or working for a CEO that isn't bought in on brand, right? There's a lot of education to be done to say like, okay, right? Here's what a strong brand can contribute to a business if you don't have a strong brand, or here's what this messiness or complexity, what challenges it's introducing to the business. And because we have that acute business need, it didn't make it easy, but it made it easier for folks to get on board to say, yeah, we right. do have to rationalize this. And so along the way, of course, we should consider visual identity and the other pieces, right? Because now you're getting in there. So like, why not look at the whole package? Right. And, and I, the, the thing that I, I, I emphasize at least in my book and in these conversations is this was not a coat of paint on an old barn. You talked about all the way through product. And so this right. was a significant company change, company-wide change in terms of your go-to-market offering and the new brand needed to reflect that. So 
All of that makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, We have a question from the audience, and it's, what's been the most unexpected aspect of your CEO role? That it's as lonely as people say it is. (laughs) So I was, and why it's unexpected is I was just kind of like, nah, that, you know, you've got, right, you've got your team, like, I was just, I kind of, you know, poo-pooed the idea of it's a lonely, it's a lonely job, but, you know, as, as we all know, right, as you rise through an organization and you have fewer and fewer peers, right, who are the people, you know, that you, you know, are, are sharing your frustrations or really can rely on them for perspective. And when you're the CEO, it's all on your shoulders. And so, how you engage with your team or how you engage with your your trusted circle it it does change and and i think that i didn't give all the wise people who told me it would be a lonely job you know enough enough yeah, didn't it's, give it's, enough credence to that it's funny cuz you know the same woes always talk about how lonely that job is because there really isn't anybody else in the organization typically who understands marketing which is of course why we have CMO huddles i mean it's and i'm curious just have you found a peer group that you can sort of go to to help you talk about the challenges of being a ceo yeah i have a couple of friends that were ceos before me that i really rely on quite a bit you know it's really great. I'm so lucky to have, you know, when I moved into this role, right, we were the Canadian operations of our former business was acquired. And so the CEO of the business that I was in, you know, continues to provide really great and wise counsel. He's also a member of our board, which is, which is great. And so how I'm using our board and how I'm kind of tapping into a new brain trust to help me in this role, you know, it's, it's been some good learning and I came around to it pretty quickly. Yeah. So to find, to make it unlonely for yourself. Yes. Yes. One of the things that, uh, uh, and in fact, I think the uh, person who actually shared this expression, if you think you can outwork this job, we're talking the CMO role, you're crazy. So we talk a lot about how the need to outsmart it. And I'm, you know, obviously that's priorities and it's effective time management. I'm curious, what's your approach to time management? Yeah. So I've got some things that are really working for me right now. So I have a great EA and that's hugely helpful, right? I'm not dealing with any of the requests or any of the complexities of juggling and changing, which is really wonderful. And, and I've had a lot of success with time boxing, And that includes every single day, don't be angry, team. Uh, Every single day, I have at least a couple of hours without meetings, which is not the world that I've come from, you know, throughout my career, but really saying, hey, it's important for me to be thinking, to be looking around corners, to be available if, you know, I need to parachute in somewhere. Um, We've also, as a broader organization, we've implemented no meeting Thursday afternoons across the organization. So this gives everybody time to do their heads down work or to have some think time, whether it's catch up, et cetera. And so we don't have any meetings anywhere in the organization on Thursday afternoon. And then the final one, and so far so good, I've, for the first time ever, embraced zero inbox. And I'd say part of that is, right, now I have now I have time. And so, you know, by having time, you know, really making sure that I'm dealing with email in a good way. And right before our huddle, I was at 19. So to me, that is as close to zero as I've been since email was invented. Oh my God. Yeah, no, zero uh, zero inboxing is, is, is one of those things that actually drives me crazy because I, I just simply can't do it. What is, what's, how how do you do that? Well, A, we mostly work in Slack. So the good news is like the world doesn't revolve around email. A couple of times a day, I just go in and I deal with everything, right? I'm deleting it. I'm flagging it to read later. I'm in action, right? The only things in my inbox right now are things that I still need to action or have eyes on. But I think when I left my last role, I had like 183,000 emails. So like, I've been on the far side of, you know, yeah, it's good to have a clean slate. So, you know, I'm six months in with a clean slate and so far so good. 
Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, it is something that a new job creates that opportunity for. So go you. I'm re-inspired to try. I certainly know all the methodologies to do it. It's a discipline and the time boxing is obviously key. Okay. So again, new organization, building this strong team, what kind of things are you doing? I, and first of all, does do you have a operating model? I mean, are you like an EOS company or an OKR company? Do you have a organizational methodology? We do have a methodology. It's really of our own definition. Well, it's one that I brought with me kind of from Microsoft that I've used over the years. So we've got a pretty good approach that we're taking to goal setting and operationalizing our business. One of our operating principles that we put in place was a focus on operational excellence, right, as being one of our biggest levers. And so we are doing a lot of things around how we can be really smart with our cadence, with our times and meetings, as well as kind of how we plan and report back to the organization. And I'm just, you know, as a former marketer, I'm imagining that you have ideas every minute. And I know lots of CMOs are really good at that. And, you know, the the CMO complaint is all, always the CEO just threw another idea at me. We kind of covered this, but how are you managing your own creativity? Because Sure, you could come up with 25 ideas that could be implemented, but there isn't time. You know, so how are you getting things back to keeping your priorities on track and holding yourself in check? Yeah, and it's not my job anymore. So I think it's about sitting with ideas for a little bit longer and then saying, okay, which of these, right, do I want to raise? And because I think, you know, all jobs can be creative. I think about my contributions to, you know, consumer experience. And so we're problem solving in that space. And so it's like, okay, I have this concept for something that, you know, we could, you know, test. And so it's starting the ball rolling of how fast could we do that test? And there's a lot of moving parts there on, you know, on the marketing front, it, I think is first about just asking good questions to understand where the thinking already is to contribute in a way that is kind of augmenting that versus saying like, there's a whole different thing. And so I've got my, my one-on-one with my CMO later today. So it's always <laughs> then checking in to be like, you know, how is this how is this going, right? Are you getting too much? Are you getting, you know, not enough and kind of checking in on, on that relationship? Yeah, I, I imagine it's hard to get honest uh, uh, answers from folks because they're going to want to tell you what you want to hear. It'll be interesting to see how you sort through that. I'm curious, looking back at your career, were there things that you wish you had learned along the way that would be really helpful right now? The one thing that I was very intentional in not doing that was never a problem, I'm not saying it's a problem now, but certainly wasn't a problem in getting to CMO, is I never held a product management role, right? So when you're in tech, right, and you're deciding your path, there are so many opportunities in product, and it just didn't light me up. And so pretty early on, I closed the door to that knowing, right, that there are fewer roles if you're closing that giant door of product in a tech company. I'm sure I could be adding more value to the product and consumer experience conversation today had I actually sat in one of those roles. Having led product marketing now is kind of my way through to say, okay, what is my experience that is helping me kind of add value to the conversation. And certainly being a brand leader where I see that role is kind of, you know, the number one advocate for your consumer, right? That's a really valuable way to, to engage with product as well. But that's a door that maybe had I thought about being CEO um, way back when that I, that I might not have closed, maybe I would have taken a tour in product. Right. Even if it didn't light you up, right. Yeah. Just because it, it was a, an important stop in the, the mix of things that mm -hmm. you're now responsible for. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, uh, looking back, anything else that you wish you had known <laughs> other than the lonely, we talked about that before taking on the job? 
Yeah, I th I would say it's really about, you know, it comes it's it's another facet of what we talked about around kind of communications. And it's not only when you're giving direction, but to think about your responsibility as a communicator, as the head of a company. And as a CMO, right, we should be really great at this. We, we've, we've trained people to be spokespersons. We've done a lot of comms. And so, you know, it's basically pulling out the playbook and applying it to yourself. Things like don't sit on bad news, communicate frequently. Don't be so focused on the problems that you forget to sprinkle in the good news and celebrate those little wins along the way. Don't be an alarmist. A CEO, your job is to calm the waters. Maybe a CMO or in another role, right? You can be the person that is, you know, ringing the alarm bells. Now it's more of like, okay, how can I take a broader view and look to really calm things down? Maybe the, those are some of the things, again, to just add some dimension to, to communications. Yeah, no, and it's a great list. So a question from the audience came in. Do you think you could or should have taken on a CEO role earlier in your career? Mm, I was having too much fun. <laughs> so maybe, but, you know, in, I spent a lot of my time in really big companies. I loved the work that I've done as a, you know, as a marketer, as a consumer marketing lead, as a, as a CMO. One of the things I learned, you know, as I was, you know, in the, in the, that like last handful of years exploring what would it take to become a CEO? One of my learnings was typically people, their first CEO job is at a company they're already at. So you know, no one, you know, Andy Jassy was in line. I wasn't in line for Jeff Bezos role at Amazon. So I think it's also the, if you, if I would have wanted to do it earlier, then it's rethinking also what company, what company size, right. And are you kind of getting in line on kind of on that slate to be a successor of someone that, that you're reporting to. And, and so I think yeah. it was both planning and luck that went into me landing at it at this stage. And and it's it is really interesting. And it's in and probably as CMO, you may have pigeonholed direct reports and saying, oh, that person's not ready, not going to be there. They're the product marketer, they're not going to be a CMO. And I'm imagining that as a CMO saying, hey, I want to be a CEO and talking to recruiters about it, they're saying, well, you've never done it. And it's got to be a hard sell. So doing it within an organization, and I and I've seen that in other with other CMOs that have become CEO, the board got to know them. They're, you know, it was a divisional opportunity or they were a GM in a mm -hmm. division. And, and that's how they, they, they sort of managed their career because you needed a group of people who already knew you and trusted that's right. you. That's right. You're a known commodity. And that's so hard to do going into a new company. I didn't think about this earlier, but as a woman, do you think about that as part of your CEO role and, and, and what that means? And, and I don't want to know the exact question, but I think you know what I mean. It's, there's a lot more male CEOs out there. Yeah. So what, yeah. what advice do you have for women who want to be the CEO? I don't think about it in my day to day. I don't feel like I carry myself differently, but I do think about it relative to my responsibility, right, as a mentor or a role model and the choices and the decisions that I'm making. And even with, you know, the very best of intentions, as I established what I consider to be an amazing leadership team, I only have one woman on my leadership team. And there was, we didn't talk about this, right? There was the amazing moment where I could hand pick, but I'm hand picking out of the organization we're coming from. I'm building my whole team from scratch, right? As a CEO or as a leader, it's not often that you're building your whole team from scratch. I built an amazing team. I feel great about every single person in their seat. Do I feel great that I only have one woman in another executive role? No, I don't. And so then that causes me to make sure that I'm focusing on, you know, where are our up and coming women leaders on the next layer down? What opportunities are we providing for women? Because I certainly know that 
women can see each other as competitors and not to say like it's everyone at the table right that I might be competing for with the next role and you know I don't think that way and I also don't want it to kind of look that way. So definitely feel like there's a lot of opportunity when you just think about building capability in an organization and making sure that great women are being kind of spotlighted and, and, and given opportunities. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, amazing conversation. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I want to wrap up. Maybe you could provide two do's and a don't for CMOs who aspire to become CEOs in their organization. All right, let's wrap up there. Number one, we talked about this, give voice to your ambition. So internally and with your network, people don't know what's in your head, what's in your heart, right? The likelihood that that's gonna happen is less. So give voice to your ambition. I would say contribute at a business level first. And so Drew, you mentioned this, right? Marketers show up as marketers whether on a board or on an ELT, you know, show up at a business level first and at a functional level second. And that means that you're going to need to like stay up to speed on the business and making sure that you have well-informed opinions on those key business topics and that you're able to catalyze conversations that aren't necessarily in your lane. And then on the don'ts, I would say, don't be shy about filling out your dance card with experiences that were going to help you make the case, right? Each of us have a different case for whatever next step we have in our career, but, you know, propose new areas of investment like I did with data storytelling or raise your hand to head up, you know, some new speculative strategy and think about, you know, do you have enough pieces on the board to, to make a compelling argument? I love it. All right. Well, Karen Starnes, CEO of Ojo Canada, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.